for the reading of the word. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I ask you to repeat after me this text in Titus 2, beginning in uh, Titus, the second chapter, uh, and verse 11. For the grace of God, the grace of God that brings salvation, bring salvation, salvation hath appeared to all men, appeared to all men teaching, us that, teaching us that, denying ungodliness, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, and worldly lusts, lusts we should live soberly, we should live soberly righteously, righteously, and godly, and godly in this present world. In this present world. Amen. Amen. The story is told of a preacher who was ready to preach a sermon and began the lesson. He told the church, I'm going to need you to help me with my lesson this morning. He said, I'm going to be calling out different words. Uh, and as I call out those words, I want you to begin singing the first song that comes to your mind. And so the preacher got up and he said, cross. The church began to sing the old rugged cross. And then the preacher said, grace. Everybody jumped right in with amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And then the preacher said, power. And they began to sing, there's power in the blood. And then the preacher said, sex! And everybody got quiet. They didn't know what to say. He found an older sister, raised her hand, and jumped up, began to say, precious memories, oh, how they live. <laughs> challenge you on this morning, we're going to the book of Titus in our last time, we looked in Titus 2, and Paul talked about, we talked about, we didn't talk about Rudy to go fruity, we talked about from the rootage to the fruitage, we talked about how from the roots we have the fruits of Titus 2. Then we close off looking at the sense of grace, and there's nothing as powerful as grace. And if you look at this a pericope of text, I invite you to look at someone near and ask them, why do I need grace? Why do I need, I need grace? grace? Amen. Amen. I want you to see the, the necessity and the value of the grace of God and why it relates to your life. Um, our world is full of, of chaos and confusion. Yes. All around you, crazy stuff is happening and folk acting crazy. They Amen. think crazy, they talk crazy, and they act crazy. Yes. Because you're living in a world of confusion and a world of chaos. And what God has done to alleviate that, he's giving us access to his, his grace. And the reason that grace is important is because God having made you as his image Sin creates a wall and a barrier between you and your maker. That's right. And sin exists because we are determined sometimes to do things our own way. And so here inside of, we'll look at a, a variety of passages on this morning, but here the idea of grace, I want you to first of all begin to understand the concept of grace and what it actually means. So what, is, what is grace? Well, first of all, it's from the Greek word charis. Say charis. Charis. And the word is, the root of the word uh, is also the word you get the word gift from. Uh, joy. Joy and gift are also uh, from charis. So it's parts of thankfulness. It refers to anything that makes you rejoice. It's beauty, it's charm, it's favor, it's gratitude. Grace is anything that makes you 
rejoice. Mm -hmm. Now, going beyond that, let me share with you what it is on a deeper level. Uh, in the Old Testament, the word is, is hen, uh, which means favor, attitude of a superior or an inferior. So it has, in the Old Testament, the concept of it is the attitude of a superior in dealing with somebody who is inferior. The attitude of one who is greater than you dealing with somebody who is less than you. Another key word in the Old Testament for this is the word chesed. Now, now with the Hebrew, you don't just say hey, it's a it's a don't do that in nobody's face too close, but I ask you to repeat the word chesed. Chesed. Chesed is God's loving kindness. It is, it is faithful love in involving covenant. Chesed connects with the idea of God's loving kindness and it's connected with the sense of involving a covenant. A covenant is a committed relation, a committed agreement between two. Uh, anybody can be uh, on credit cards. That was a covenant commitment. You said to them, y'all give me some money or y'all give me this merchandise and I will covenant with you that I will give you back more than you gave me. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And that's what, that's what a covenant is. It's a commitment between two parties. One saying, I will do this much. The other was saying, I will do that much. So therefore, Hesed is a faithful love involving a covenant commitment. It's God's loving kindness towards you when God looks upon you and says, because I love you and because I care for you, I will do this on your behalf. It's the same kind of commitment almost that a parent makes to a child when a parent says to a child, there's literally, absolutely nothing for the first several number of years that you can do for me. That's right. You can't buy me nothing, you can't get me nothing, all you can do is spit up stuff. <laughs> and so parents begin by saying, I make a commitment to you, I make a covenant commitment with you, I will provide you, I'll supply for you, I'll do whatever you need. Right. Now the difference is that you do that with an expectation of somehow getting something back. Amen. Bless your poor soul. Yeah. <laughs> you don't always get something back from your kids, Amen. And so the, the idea of the word, the word of the idea of grace. And so if, if faith is our response, faith, faith, my faith is my response to God's covenant. Faith is my response to God's, God's agreement, to God's plan for my benefit. That's what my faith is. So if faith is my response to that, in that context, then grace is actually God's action in establishing a covenant. See, grace is not something that God gives you. What God gives you is not just grace. God gives you God. He said, I will give you myself. I don't give you something, I give you me. And so I want you to realize, grace is, it is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God loving you in spite of yourself. Grace is God's ability to put a plan together to help you. And do all that's needed to make sure that you're successful. And you're blessed by the benefit of what God does on your behalf. So, so grace is God's gift to you. It's what he does because he understands that you need something that you cannot do for yourself. So let's understand how this goes together. So when you have grace, when you understand the benefit of grace, grace changes some things by how you think and function. But first of all, understand this then. That you, when you have grace, you realize you no longer have a need to hide. Why is that preaching? Well, because here's what Peter Paul says about it in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. He says, but by the grace of God, I just am what I am. And I, I don't want you to miss that. By the grace of God, I am or I is what I is. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. I didn't just get God's grace and it did nothing. Because God's grace does something to you if you understand what happens when you get some grace. What did it do for you, Paul? Well, Paul said what it did. He said, no, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I. I understood. He said, it was the grace of God that was working in me. And so understand, Paul said, I want you to know, when you receive grace, when you understand the value and the significance of the grace of God, the grace of God puts you in a mindset where you don't longer have to hide. Now what in the world does that mean? Well, understand the concept of grace tells the truth about you. 
See, the reality of it is that about you and others, we hide the truth of ourselves to avoid exposure. Why would you hide the truth about you? Because you know how to forget. If I know you got issues, well, Harris, I thought you were all right. No, you got issues. But I thought you, I, being all right, I thought meant you had no issues. At least any issue you had had to be better than mine. You had to have something small, like maybe you didn't buy your wife a sandwich last week. Or she asked to go by the store. You didn't buy the milk at the store. And Harris messed up. Only thing he ever done wrong this week was wife said, honey, bring a, a, a gallon of milk in, and he forgot. And then what she said, we got you in real trouble. Yeah. <laughs> See, what grace does, it tells the truth about ourselves. Grace lets you drop your mask. When I understand God's unlimited favor, I don't have to fake anymore. See, the problem is this. The fact of the matter is, wrong button. Okay. The fact of the matter is that you drop your fake abilities. See, the dilemma is that sometimes if you're not careful, you begin to think that you got where you are because you're so smart. And you're so good. It's always amazing when I listen to, to, uh, to Donald Trump talk. It's always, you know, you know, love this. They, go, they love me. China loves me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop them here on Monday. And China loves me. In, in, in Mexico, they love me. And my book is the best book ever written. And if I said it, it could not have been said any better. I'm always the best. I'm the best. I'm the top. I am all of that. I was all of that before I got here. I'm all that now. I'll be all of that when I'm gone. But there's something about that mentality that we feed into. We have a tendency to believe that somehow you are where you are because you're so great. Some folks graduated high school, magna cum laude, and some graduated sigma cum laude, but I graduated high school, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I, I crawled. I crawled out of high school. And because of that, I really, I really thought I had an inability to learn. I, I thought that, that I was, it, was, it, wasn't, it was not the fact that, uh, that, that, that it was no, not my fault because I just knew my grades were so poor because I just could not learn. And so uh, after we, with Laura helped me get uh, uh, registered in college, I started taking classes, and I realized that the only reason my grades were so poor is there was some, one small piece I missed. And the word was called study. <laughs> I just thought I'd go to class, and I was, you know, I was like some of our, I mean, I'm sure all our kids in here look very smart. Uh, like they do homework, and they actually do study, right? And y'all purposely, you realize that the test tomorrow is on what you had last month. So I would show up to class, I'd show up to school that morning, and I would say, oh man, homework due? <laughs> can, I, can I copy your, you got your stuff? You got your stuff? Come on, man, let me, just, let me see. Let me see. I don't have any of the answers. Give me any. And, I, and three minutes for the bell rings to go to class, I'm just trying to scribble off somebody's paper. And then the test time come up, and I, I, I show up to class. Oh, we got a test today? <laughs> and so I thought, but see, what I understand also is that there's some people, and, and bless you, when I was in college, in my, my college years, uh, it got me good. I've got three master's degrees, so I survived all that. But, but when I was doing my graduate work, I, I would sit down to do a paper. I would get into a room, and I have books stacked up all around me. I just sit there for hours. I didn't want to leave a room. I just throw food in the room and lock the door. I'm not leaving out of here. I, I got to get this stuff out of my head. And the thing is that 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 I realized I had to. I had to put all that energy and all that time. Now some folks, some of you are smart, smart. Well, you ain't got to study like that. I, it took me hours. Upon hours upon hours to get stuff. But see, that's a gift. I understand that the person who can read it once and got it, bless them. That was a gift. For those of you who are, who are, who are gifted athletes, like uh, Brother Sister Williams, you know, they're both gifted athletes. Or Brother Thomas Williams, Sister Sheila, they went out and played uh, tennis uh, yesterday and, and they chased each other around the court. Who won the? Uh, Okay, he he kind of he kind of beat him, but they but they chased each other around the. T it, it, some of you can't can one up to a a, 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 a a tennis net, let them jump over one. The point is, the idea there's nothing. You, every grace helps you to realize 
no matter where you are, no matter what you have, it's all a gift from God. And when I understand the gift of grace is the idea, I can drop faking like it's because I'm so smart and I, I got it all together and, and ain't, nobody, ain't, ain't nobody like me, ain't nobody knew it like me, can't nobody flow like me, can't nobody roll like me. It ain't about me. It's the realization grace establishes that whatever I am, whatever I get, whatever great happens for me, it's all because God gave me a gift. But it also has a flip side of that, and that is that even when things go traumatically wrong in life, if my life is upside down, I've made consistently bad choice after bad choice after bad choice after bad choice. Grace reminds me that not only, I, I, not only do I need to be free of a perception that I'm great all by myself, I've got to be free of an understanding that in my shortcomings and in my weaknesses, God does not care. Grace establishes that no matter how bad I've been, no matter how messed up I've been, no matter how tossed up I've been, He will bless me and bring me out. I thank God for grace because it establishes even in my own mess, God is good. So grace allows you to stop hiding. Because yes. you stop focusing on what you think was good about you. You focus now on God's control. I focus now that if it goes well, it's not because I was the best. Matter of fact, the crazy thing is, some of the folks for the kids in school right now, you got some kids in school with me. That kids, there were kids in school with me who made straight A's. Yeah, yeah. They can't find no job. You really think because if you're doing halfway good, that somehow it's because you're the best? They're a whole lot smarter folk than you. Smarter, more gifted, more talented, more able, have not gotten half the breaks that you've had. All because of God's grace. Every time I see every winter, every winter here, when we've gone downtown and tried to minister to those who are homeless, who are hiding under a bridge trying to duck the snow and the ice, trying to get near anything warm, or who've gotten who, who give a plastic home with cardboard and sleeping in there trying to use their own body heat to survive the winter, it's not because they're the worst of people in the city. You have been blessed. You didn't pick your family. You didn't pick where you were born at. You didn't pick where you were raised at. Everything you have, as, as Paul would say, what do you have that you have not been given? Amen. Yes. Amen. Grace reminds you, as we said already inside this text, it reminds you that she has no reason to hide anymore. But by the grace of God, I am. Paul said, I am what I am. I ain't trying to hide. I ain't trying to duck. I'm not trying to act like I'm the best apostle. I'm not the best preacher. I'm not the most talented. I'm not the most educated. I'm not, not the most trained. But Paul said, all I know is I am what I am. And I thank God that I'm going to allow me to be whatever he choose to let me be. And if you understand that, those in the family of God who work the hardest are the ones who realize I know that. A lot of folk are not engaged and not involved because somehow you think you are more than what you actually are. Come on, preacher. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was. Sometimes your kids can get big headed like that. I ain't wearing no kind of shoes. I ain't wearing no Walmart, Kmart shoe. I need some shoes with a real name on them. I told my kids coming up, they said, I want, I want name brand shoes. I told them, there's no name better than your name. Oh, <laughs> Write your name on that shoe. <laughs> Who's Michael Jordan? You put your name on the shoe. <laughs> that make that shoe mean something. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> Brag about somebody else's name. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. That's what I told my kids. <laughs> but Paul said, because of the grace of God, it made me work even harder. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you understand how good God has been to you, yeah. it'll make you get outside yourself. Yes, sir. I, I, some of y'all, maybe some of y'all started off too high. But, but if you start up low enough, yeah. uh, you know, I, I come from back in the day when uh, you only had two pairs of shoes. At the church going to meet you. You had only one? Well, bless you. 
we graduated the school. Uh, <laughs> we had the church school to meet the shoes. And now, I know we got, we're in a different world right now because our young folks now, they got such nice shoes, they can't even wear them. That's right. Yeah, some boys bottom, bottom tennis shoes. Yeah. Uh, do, do they call them tennis shoes? That's the right term for it? That's a disrespectful term. <laughs> but they bottom them and, and tie the strings together and hang them on their neck. I have the shoe. Now, if I wear them, I mess them up so to avoid messing them up, I can show them. God bless you. And, and some of you sisters up in there, I know you can recall when you only had a few pairs of shoes. Before you had a few hundred right now. <laughs> Paul established that there. He said that because I am what I am. And for that reason, I worked hard. But I understand it wasn't me working. It was that God extended his grace to me. And when you understand and value the grace of God in your life, it'll drive you. It'll make you be more involved. But, uh, if, if I, but to get involved, i got to deal with all these people who can get on my last nerve. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. Yeah. Because, because that's, that's how God grows you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Well, tell somebody, you ain't got to hide no more. Yeah. The, the term grace equals discipleship. Grace. See, cheap grace is Christianity without discipleship. Do you not know that Jesus never told you to become a Christian? He didn't say become a Christian. He said, I want disciples. We have Christianized discipleship. The call is not to become, uh, being a Christian is supposed to mean that you are a disciple, a learner of Jesus. Somebody who's made a conscious decision to be like the Lord. Expensive grace never leaves you where you found, where it found you. When you receive the grace of God, it's going to change you from who you were to what God needs you to be. When you understand the value of grace, you stop thinking you all that. You become changed and transformed. You understand everything in my life is a gift. You got to get to the place where you learn the value of what you already have. The problem is that we have a short memory. Every time, you should wake up every day being thankful that you're not hurting. Because you can recall the days you woke up and you were hurting. Amen. You ought to wake up every morning thankful that God loves you because, because you, your, your body's functioning well. You can eat and keep the food down. You ought to be thankful because there, you have people in your life. You call your friends. There's somebody who cares about you because you can recall times that God allows you to go through the, the rough, difficult days of life so you can be reminded of what it means to trust God right now. When you understand how blessed you are right now, you can recall the days when you were not as blessed. Anybody in there ever had their lights turned off before because you didn't pay the bill? I've been there. I appreciate my lights. <laughs> but there's something happens when you realize that everything in your life is an extension of the grace of God. Grace is a limitless, a limitless forgiveness. It's a limitless forgiveness. Everybody ain't gonna forgive you for the crazy stuff you do. But God says, my child, I love you so much that I will forgive you. Now, I, I love my kids, and I'll forgive my kids. Now, there are things they can do toward me. That's going to make it real difficult to forgive you. <laughs> I got much love for you, but I'm going to tell you right now, you can sleep on the street and make the curve your pillow. You ain't going to treat me like that. But I want you to know, we're called to be like the God who's blessed us and called us for this kind of connection. It's a limitless forgiveness, and, but grace requires obedience. When you receive the grace of God, it expects certain behavior out of you. See, Matthew 5, 4, he says this, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It requires obedience. God wants you perfect. I don't know about you, but, but how many parents in here praise your kids for making D's and F's? Give me some grace, baby. Oh, bless you. You only had four F's and three D's? I'm so proud of you. If, if that's 
the best you can do? Uh, let me help you with this, because we live in a different world. Every parent needs a good parent. Amen. They got too many parents uh, dealing with their own frustration and their own lives and trying to relive their life to their kids. I, I know some parents would tell their children, baby, look, look, look. Well, okay, well, honey, you didn't pass. But you know, I didn't pass either. <laughs> and I'm all right. So, you know, I understand. You know what I mean? Sometimes, no, the teacher don't like me. The school don't like me. The principal don't like me. Nobody like me. They put me in the wrong place. I feel what? I, they, they look at me. I can tell the way she look at me, she don't like me. You know, ain't nobody like me. Everybody against me. Why everybody against me? I'm not understand. Everybody against I don't know why everybody against you. They are like, you a good kid. I don't know why. Just because you stop the teacher, that doesn't mean you're a bad kid. Uh, that can happen to everybody. Everybody gets upset sometimes. I get upset like that too. It's all good. You know, just if you can stay in school today, that might be. Be nice and what you can do. A good parent expects you to give your best. Amen. Baby, if your best is a C, I'm proud of your C. Yeah, that's your best. But the idea, I'm going to settle for mediocrity, I'm going to settle for you being sorry and being able, and able to do something. A parent's job is supposed to be to, to push your kids. The Bible calls them, in, 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 in the psalmist, the psalmist says that, that the children are like arrows. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're supposed to shoot them out to arrows you can't get to yourself. Man. I expect my kids to surpass me in some way. Yeah. I put, I, I, I'm without food. I want up certain gifts and things of life. We, I held back so you can have an access not to be sorry. I held back so that you can be greater than I was. Amen. If that's the case, then there's no way. I'm gonna God, just like a parent, a good parent, wants the best out of their children. I expect better out of you. If good parents that way, don't you think God sees you the same way? He said, Yes, my child. I know you got shortcomings. I know you got weaknesses. I know you got struggles. I'm aware of all of that, but I have the highest level of expectation of you. I am not satisfied with you being mediocre. I'm not satisfied with you being sorry. I'm not satisfied with you giving your least. I want to see the best that you have. Amen. Because you can't excel unless you're giving out your best. Yes. Other than the reality, only he who believes obeys. Mm -hmm. And only he who obeys really believes. If you're not obeying, it's a sign you don't really believe. Yes, sir. So when you talk about the sense, we share this with you. We, we do a workshop on parenting styles. And, and, and here's the crazy thing about parenting. You caught it from your parents. And, and, and everybody parents didn't know how to parent. I know we go back to how, how your, your, your family, now some of you young kids now, y'all don't know how y'all got good stuff. Because uh, some of us older folk had to go through stuff that they did in torture chambers back in the day. I mean, uh, I know some of you have had, uh, <laughs> my mother-in-law, would, would, when she would get the spanking, they got in the bed, she'd throw a brick into the bed. And if you come from that bed, one way or another, y'all, you going to stay under there? Take all this. <laughs> That'll drive you from the bed. <laughs> my mother wasn't that graphic. My parents, were, they would actually, they put, put rice on the floor. Kneel on that. Oh, that'll get your attention. <laughs> but my point is the idea that, that, that most of us learn parenting uh, from our parents. But let me share with you briefly, briefly, that there's actually, that there's four basic parenting styles. And each style of parenting is based on two components, what's called responsiveness and demandingness. Responsiveness and demandingness. Responsiveness is how you respond to a child's needs. Demandingness is what you expect out of your child. Responsiveness and demandingness. Matter of fact, let me share this with you. Uh, 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 neglectful parenting, neglectful parenting is parenting that is low on demands and low on response. That means neglectful parenting is what you do. They take your kids for neglect. That means I don't expect nothing out of you, and I ain't doing nothing for you. So when a child comes home from school, Mom, I'm hungry. Yeah, baby, I already ate. Well, I'm hungry. I already ate. You hungry? Figure out how to eat. 
in, in, a, in a neglectful family environment, low on response, and low, I'll do nothing for you. I expect nothing out of you. What, what's your child? What's your 10 year old? It's, it's 11 o'clock at night. They know what a house is. They, can, they know how to come on when they get ready. That, that's, they, they take your kids for that. It's low on response and low on demand. Another kind we call permissive parenting. Permissive parenting, another word for that, that's what true spoiling is. Spoiling or permissive parenting is high on response and low on demand, which means I'll do everything for you and you ain't got enough for yourself. So as a parent basically says, you know, no, baby, what you want? No, 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 no. I'll make up your bed. I'll wash your clothes. I'll fix your dinner. I'll take you where you gotta go. No, no, no. I, I do everything for you. You need some money? Here's some money. Or you need my car? Here's a car. What you need? I, I, I do everything for you, and I expect nothing out of you. That, that's, that is, that's what spoiling actually is. It's the idea that you have to do absolute, absolutely nothing in this household. And to the young folk up in there, God bless you, but actually, you learn how to be an adult at your home. And so the reason they tell you, clean your room. It's because they want you, at some point in life, you can have your own stuff, and if you live in a junky, smelly, trashy room now, when you get grown, you can have a junky, smelly, trashy house. Amen. Amen. So understand, for Mr. Parenting, is a parenting that doesn't respond. Properly. Well, the next kind we talk about is authoritarian. Authoritarian, uh, authoritarian, authoritarian parenting is high on, on, on demand and low response. It's a parent that says, I want, I, want, I want the best out of you, and I ain't doing nothing for you. So I, I want you to bring straight A's in. Well, I need a tutoring, and I got to stay up for school. No, no, you ain't staying up for school, and you ain't getting no tutoring. Well, can I get the internet? No, I want straight A's. I'm not going to provide nothing for you to get that. That's, that's the wrong kind of parenting. Right. Let me share what God does. He does authoritative parenting. He's high on demand. And he's high on response. In other words, God expects a lot out of you. Yes, does. Amen. The Bible says he, wants you, he expects you to have faith. Right. right? Well, how do you get faith? Faith comes from hearing the word of God. So God gives you his word so you can have the faith. He expects you to have faith. And he gives you what you need to have faith. That's right. Matter of fact, sometimes God allows trouble in your life so you can get some faith out of that trouble. That's right. Trouble gives you faith. Brother, you count it all joy when you face different types of trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith, yes, sir. faith is tested. Trouble will make your faith stronger. Yes, so God said, I want you to have faith. I'll give you what you need to get faith. Romans 5 says that the love of God is pouring to our hearts. So God said, I want you to love folk more, and I'll make sure that happens. I'll give you the love I want you to share. Go ahead and preach, bro. Everything that God expects out of you, he gives it to you first. Yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, if God said, I want keys to tell to impact the world, then God makes sure this church has all the people it needs to achieve that goal. Yes. Yeah. Leadership said we need more finances to cover the goals that God has given us. The church response is supposed to be, well, if, the, if, if God needs me to give more, everything the church needs to achieve the goals it's here for is already here. Amen. And if we're not achieving it, it's because somehow we're not being the children he's called us to be. All right. But I want you to realize that God's a great parent because God... Actually, he, he, he expects a lot out of you, and he gives you everything that you need to achieve those goals. He calls you to be like your daddy, and you go act like your daddy. It might be the devil, or it might be the Lord, but you're going to act like your daddy. Amen? Amen. Tell somebody, grace requires, grace requires obedience. And so grace is faithful. Grace. Look at the text here. As, as Paul expresses it, but thanks, the word thanks in the, in the Greek actually the word charis, our word for grace, uh, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession, procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Understand, grace, grace makes you thankful. We are thanks-driven people. A disciple of Christ is thanks driven. Dealing with my mother's sickness here the last few months uh, reminded me, first of all, of, of 
her, her mortality. Uh, with, uh, 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 we had a conversation, I think, I'm not sure if, if uh, Laura said it or my mother said it, but she said that, that there's only two of us left. Uh, both my sisters are gone and my father's gone. It's just my mom and I left. And, and, uh, and in that conversation, uh, as I even discussed it with her, at one point, you, you, if, you, if you're what God has called you to be, you've got to learn to be thankful for whatever he that you have. I would ask God for my mother's help and strength in many more years, but I've had to accept the reality, she's not going to be here. I don't care if it's another six months, I don't care if it's another year, or another two days. She is not going to live forever. Yes, sir. But now is she not going to live forever? I'm not going to get there. Right. Now time's going to come. I'm, I'm, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> what about, you know, are you going to walk out? You're going to trip out? You're going to fall out? Get knocked out? But ain't nobody going to stay up forever. Amen. You are going to die. Yes, sir. And everybody you know yes. is going to die. That's right. That's right. And so what you have to learn to do is learn to value. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What you have right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank God for the moments you do have. Be able to sit down and...